Hi, my name is Jen Balava. I'm a naturalist with the Burlington County Park System. I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite groups of insects, the dragonflies and damselflies. These are really fascinating insects and I hope you gain a better appreciation for, for them after watching this. These insects have been highly admired by the Japanese for thousands of years heavily used in poetry and other art, and there's even entire museums and sanctuaries for dragonflies in Japan. In North America, the reputation is starting to improve. More and more people, I guess you could say, tolerate or like dragonflies, but that may be just because they are pretty, um, and we know that they are very, very important beneficial insects. So that should be the reason why people like them. In North America and Britain, there have been all kinds of myths that have been started from long time ago, where they have mistakenly been called devil's darning needles and accused of sewing up the ears of bad children. And even called horse stingers on the mistaken notion that they sting. So we're gonna put all those myths to rest. We know from fossil evidence that dragonflies are truly ancient insects. They've been around since the Paleozoic era in the Carboniferous period 320 million years ago and it it turns out that these were the largest flying insects of all time. They had a whopping 28 inch wingspan, a body length of 17 inches long, and they were actually found in what is now the Midwest. The oxygen rich atmosphere at the time allowed insects to grow much bigger than they are now. So we can be thankful that we don't have giant insects like this anymore. So dragonflies and damselflies are of course classified as insects. And within that classification, they are known collectively as odonata. And odonata, that's the name we give to dragonflies and damselflies as one. And it derives from the Greek for odonto, which means tooth, right? Odonto, orthodontist. In any case, we don't really think of insects as having uh, teeth, but the dragonflies and damselflies definitely have chewing mouth parts, and they definitely have a tooth mandible that allows them to chew their food. So that's where their name comes from. And something that's really unique about this group and no other group of insects is that they, their four wings move independently of one another. And this is very significant because it allows them to fly in ways that other insects cannot, making them incredible aerial acrobats, which we're going to touch on in just a moment. They're found in our area from generally June to September, but of course, uh, if the weather is warmer, we can see them even longer into the year. And normally, if you look close to water, that's a good place to find these insects. And usually, uh, there needs to be some kind of vegetation near that water body. So let's take a look at the difference between dragonflies and damselflies. First, dragonflies generally hold their wings flat out to the side at rest, whereas damselflies fold their wings together above their body at rest. Dragonflies are generally larger with regards to their abdomen and they're more powerful flyers whereas damselflies are generally smaller and skinnier abdomen and are, for the most part, under two inches long. Dragonflies have their bottom two wings broader at the base than the forewing, 
which we'll look at in a picture in just a minute. Whereas damselflies have all their wings the same size and shape. And finally, dragonflies have their eyes that looks like they're stuck together on the top of their head and are extremely large, pretty much taking up their whole head. Whereas damselflies, it looks like their eyes are separated um, and we'll be able to see that well in the next group of pictures. So on this slide, you should be able to tell from looking at the side and top views which ones are dragonflies and which ones are damselflies. And I'll give you a moment to determine that. Okay, so the two insects on the top row are damselflies. You can see the skinnier abdomen. The wings are the same size and shape. They're held above their body at rest and their eyes are separated uh, on either side of the head. And then the dragonflies are on the bottom row. Their wings held out to the side at rest. Their eyes stuck together on the top. Their wings, you can see the bottom two wings are wider than the two top four wings. And, uh, and they hold their wings out to the side at rest. Now, of course, there's always an exception to every rule in nature. And there's this group of damselflies known as spread wings that do hold their wings sort of out to the side. But you can definitely tell it's a damselfly by its body shape and its eyes and so forth. And when you see them from the side, even though they're holding their wings out, it's still a held above their body. So those are the ways to tell dragonflies and damselflies apart. Odinates in our state of New Jersey are incredibly diverse. New Jersey is the third smallest state by area in the country, but ranks fourth for the longest list of dragonfly and damselfly species. And that's behind big states like Texas, Virginia, and New York. This is due mainly to the fact that New Jersey is very diverse in its topography and geography, and we have uh, different what we call provinces. We have the Ridge and Valley and the Highlands and the Pinelands and the Coastal Plain, and all of these things create different types of habitats for all these different kinds of species. So we have 125 species of odonates in our area. And there are some pineland specialists as well, because of course the pinelands offers some unique habitats for certain species that don't exist elsewhere. Of course, there are some species that reach the end of their southern range in northern New Jersey, and then there are those that reach their, their northern range in South Jersey. So. We have an incredible diversity here, and I think most people have no idea that we have so many species. So it is really, really impressive. One of the most important things to understand about this group of insects is just how beneficial they are to the environment and to us. The adult dragonflies and damselflies eat tons of flying insects. And that includes a lot of the, of the pests that we really don't like, like mosquitoes and biting flies. And the nymphs, which we're going to talk about in just a, just a few minutes, eat aquatic prey, mostly uh, mosquito larvae and fly larvae. So in all parts of their life cycle, the adults and the nymphs are consuming large quantities of insect pests. And so these are very beneficial predators. So odonates are probably the most effective hunters in the entire animal kingdom. And I don't think we would normally think of insects as being the most effective hunters, uh, but their success rate in catching prey is 95%. And compared to major predators that we normally think of, like lions and sharks, this is 
an incredible difference, as you can see here, with regards to their success rate in catching prey. So they really have a bottomless appetite and they ambush their prey from above or behind in flight instead of chasing or pursuing like many other predators. And so how is this incredible success in catching prey possible? Well, first they have a ridiculously sophisticated nervous system which allows them to track a moving target and then calculate a trajectory to intercept that target and even change that mid-flight. And they have a full 360 degree field of vision with at least 30,000 facets per eye. You're not sneaking up on a dragonfly. And as far as flight, I mentioned in the introduction that their four wings move independently. So that allows them to be able to hover, dive, fly backwards, upside down, and even pivot a full 360 degrees with just three wing beats. And they can reach speeds of up to 30 miles per hour. So now we're going to look at the life cycle of the odonates. So they all have to lay their eggs in or near water. So some of them lay their eggs directly on the water surface. Some of them will lay their eggs inside aquatic vegetation. And some just attach their eggs to the outside of aquatic plants. The eggs can hatch anywhere within five to 10 days if they're in, let's say, a temporary body of water, while others can take up to several months. So when the eggs hatch, we see nymphs emerging. So the nymphs are the immature life cycle stage for dragonflies and damselflies. And when they hatch from those eggs, they're in the water, right? So they're entirely aquatic, they're swimming around, and they have a modified lower lip with two spiny barbs that they that can be retracted and folded under their head when not in use. They are ridiculously uh, vicious at being able to capture prey. They're the top invertebrate aquatic predators in most water bodies, consuming huge amounts of uh, mosquito larvae and so forth, and here are some pictures that show what the dragonfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs look like in, in general. Obviously, there's lots of variation, but the dragonflies generally have a wider abdomen without really any tails, and the damselflies are skinnier with two to three, uh, usually three tails at the base. This is an actual dragon hunter nymph exoskeleton that we found at Smithville Park. So this was one of the largest uh, nymphs I've ever seen. The dragon hunter is a species that hunts other dragonflies, so it's, it's enormous, and so is the nymph. As you can see here, that's not the real nymph, that's the case that it left behind after it came out of the water. So it, these are, are, these particular insects are in the nymph stage, for most of their life. This stage lasts generally around one to two years, which is normal for most species in our area, believe it or not. And once the nymph has finally reached the end of that part of its life cycle, it climbs out of the water and tightly attaches itself to some kind of aquatic vegetation whatever support is available in order to make the incredible transformation into an adult. So the nymph will start to swallow air and that will cause a split to open up along the top of the thorax, the exoskeleton. And as it continues to swallow air, it will slowly start to emerge from that shell of its exoskeleton. And during this whole process, the insect is helpless. So a lot of times this occurs at night when they're 
less vulnerable to predators like birds. So the legs will then harden, the abdomen will inflate and expand to its full length, and then finally the wings are pumped full of blood and eventually start to stretch and harden. Once the exoskeleton is fully hardened, then the adult can fly. And since I can't show a video within a video, I'm going to show you some still photos of this adult basically emerging from the nymph's exoskeleton. It really looks like something out of an alien movie. You can see this is actually a darner species and it's starting to emerge out of the back. You can see the legs and the folded wings as it starts to come out. It's really very strange. These are some photos I took in the county parks that show newly emerged dragonflies that where you can see the, the nymph's exoskeleton still hanging just below it. And this particular dragonfly has brand new wings that haven't fully hardened yet. So I just wanted to show a picture of how, how that transformation is not exactly quick. It takes a little while. So these wings haven't fully formed yet. These newly emerged adults are called tannerals. And what, what these are, really just generally pale and unmarked, usually clear, don't have their adult coloration yet. So at this stage, they can be impossible sometimes to identify because it takes their body and wing markings one to two days to fully develop. They can eat at this time, but they cannot mate. So as you can imagine, sometimes we see some individuals that can be really hard to identify because they haven't developed their adult coloration yet. So these are some photo examples. Here we see an autumn meadowhawk, the adult on the bottom right, bright red. But uh, when it was just emerged, it was this pale orange with eyes that were definitely not red yet. So it looks very different. Here is an example with the blue corporal species. On the right, you can see the adult male and the adult female coloration, whereas the tenoral is definitely not looking like either of them. It's orange, but it has those two white stripes on the top of the thorax, which help identify it. And here's another photographic example of the blue-faced meadowhawk, which has a really brilliant bright red abdomen and blue eyes, but you can see photos of what it looks like before that, where it doesn't have the blue eyes and it has sort of an orange abdomen. And in the one picture, you can see it sort of changing over in between. Odonates can be divided into two major groups of behavioral traits. We have some that are what we call perchers, and then we have others that are patrollers. The perchers are really nice, easy to look at, excellent photographic subjects. If they fly off to get an insect, they come right back to their perch. So these are much easier to observe and, and study and ID. There's another uh, kind of behavior called obelisking. And this posture, it looks kind of like a handstand. And a lot of our dragonfly species will do this to regulate heat. So they can actually direct the sun's rays directly onto their thorax to warm their wing muscles so that they can fly nice and fast and they can uh, change direction depending on uh, the time of day. So if you see this kind of posture, it's not normal perching that's called obelisking. So now we have our other our other group, the patrollers, 
and patrollers are much harder to identify because they just keep flying back and forth and extremely difficult to catch a photo of. Uh, and these are generally large dragonflies. It doesn't include any of our damselflies. Some species of odonates are very territorial. Generally, the larger species are more territorial and they develop faster. Many of adult males will actually establish and defend territory along the perimeter of a particular water body. Of course, the reason why some males are particularly territorial is to basically defend an area so that if a female comes along, of course she needs to lay eggs in some type of aquatic situation, whether it's on plants or in the water directly, they'll be in the perfect situation in, to take advantage of mating with her. So in, with regards to odonates, there is a very unique thing called the wheel. And uh, it basically occurs because the interlocking structures on the male claspers and the female head enables this strange wheel formation. And uh, so we're gonna look at some pictures of that. So here in these pictures, we have damselflies on the left and in the wheel, it just so happens to form a heart. And you can see the male's claspers are on the back of her head and her abdomen will bend around to reach the top of his abdomen. Whereas dragonflies, you know, it's a little, they're quite a bit bigger. So here we see the male is clasped onto her head and the female's abdomen is reaching around like this. Once the odonates have mated, many times we'll see that the male does not let go of the female. When you see this, when you see two dragonflies flying together in a line, that's called tandem. And they do this so that another male can't come along and undo what he just did. So basically the male will stay attached to her, making sure that she lays his eggs. So this is the picture here of two damselflies in which they are attached and then she is laying eggs in the water and he is staying attached to her head while she does that. And in the case of these very large dragonflies like the comet donner and the green donner, the male will not stay attached to her head but he will hover over nearby right over while she is laying eggs. So the vast majority of the species in our area, when they get to the end of the adult part of their life cycle, they're laying eggs and then they'll die off before the winter comes. But out of the 125 species that are in our area, there are 14 that are known to be migratory. And these are large dragonflies. They normally will be migrating in our area around September to early October, and they will congregate in mass swarms following major geographic features like the coastline. Uh, you'll see large numbers of them congregating in places like Cape May that naturally funnels them to a certain point, just like birds and, and butterflies. And while they can reach their southern destinations in the Gulf of Mexico in one shot, it likely requires multiple generations for them to be able to repopulate this area again, just like monarch life cycles. So here are two examples of migratory dragonflies, the spot-winged glider on the left and the wandering glider on the right. These are both examples of migratory dragonflies in our area. 
Now for the fun part. This is where we're just going to look at pictures that represent all of the families of dragonflies and damselflies that occur in Burlington County. So the first family are the darners. These are the really large dragonflies and the most common are the green darner and the swamp darner. Next family are the club tails. These are relatively large dragonflies that have an obvious club tail. You can see some examples below. These are examples of cruisers. The Georgia River Cruiser is one that we see along the Rancocas Creek and as its name implies they cruise up and down the water very very rarely landing and these photos I took when it was actually first emerging and couldn't fly yet. The family with the most species in our area are the skimmers. And the skimmers are sort of medium-sized dragonflies. They usually have some kind of markings on their wings. These are common examples of skimmers. You can see the female and male widow skimmers, the painted skimmer, and one of my favorites, the 12 spotted skimmer. These are some more examples of skimmers. These are pennants. They have lots of spots or bars on their wings. You can see examples of them here. These are some more really common representatives of the skimmer family. The common whitetail is one that we probably see the most of everywhere. The male is the only one that has the white tail. The immatures and the females don't have the white tail yet. And then we have the amber wings, also in the skimmer family. These are really pretty smaller dragonflies definitely amber wings, the male very prominent, the female sort of moderate amber wings and spots. This is another very common example of the skimmer family. This is the blue dasher. We see these in just about all of our water bodies in Berlin County. You can see the adult male with its blue abdomen and blue eyes, female which has yellow on its abdomen. And then the male and female eastern pond hawks. These are also very common and also in the skimmer family. So there are only two families of damselflies, the broadwing damselflies and the pond damsels. So the broadwing damsels are, as described, they have very broad wings that have some kind of coloration. And this is most common one that we have in our area, very beautiful male, iridescent, ebony jewel wing, and then the female is kind of plain brown with a white spot. Here's another photo of the ebony jewel wing males. I just love them. They're just incredibly gorgeous when the sun hits them right. And then we, al we also have the sparkling jewel wing damselfly. It's also an iridescent turquoise but you can see it doesn't have the black solid wings, it just has a black tip. And then here we have a few examples of pond damsels. So the rest of the damselflies are going to look like this. Skinny, narrow, clear wings. And uh, these are just a few examples. There's many, many species. And you can see, I just kind of put some colorful ones here to give you an idea of the variety. There are threats to the survival of odonates, mostly in the form of water quality degradation. Certainly development and the removal of the surrounding habitat is mainly to blame. And what results often, if you develop area that's near a stream, if you have soil erosion and increased silt loading. And when that happens, it's not only detrimental to the creatures in the water, but also the water temperature and the dissolved oxygen levels can change. Obviously areas for feeding, mating, mating and shelter 
can disappear if you remove their habitat. Also, alteration of natural stream flow is certainly a threat to these insects. And that can happen through the process of building dams or channelizing natural stream flows. If you remove the aquatic vegetation, then obviously you're removing the plants that the eggs and the nymphs need. And certainly pesticides, various runoff of other toxins can be a serious threat to the odonates that are in the water. And any kind of excess groundwater removal is certainly another potential threat. As a result of some of those threats we just mentioned, there are certainly some species of odonates that are listed as threatened, endangered, or a special concern. There are 32 species in New Jersey that are listed as such, and eight occur in the Pinelands. Two of the Pinelands specialists actually are on the T&E species list, and they include the banner clubtail and the robust basket tail. You can report rare sightings on the DEP's Endangered and non game Species website. This is the, the report form. And really, any sightings that you see of any kind of dragonflies, there's a great website known as Odonana Central, and it's a citizen science, basically citizen science. You can report any species that you have identified and most importantly have pictures of, and you can keep track of your records on odonatacentral.org. And this helps, obviously, researchers and other people understand just where various species exist and what their numbers are like and things like that. So any sightings, you just have to make an account and uh, you can report any, any, any species, whether they're rare or not, on Odonata Central. There's also something known as the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership. And this is a really fantastic organization that's trying to better understand migratory dragonflies, a little bit more about where they go, because so little is known. So if you create an account with them, you can help track the four most common migratory species, and they give you all kinds of instructions on how to do that in a data sheet. And this is a, a pretty cool thing to do if you have students in September or October. It's a great thing to participate in. And finally, I wanted to end with examples of some of the field guides that I recommend for identifying the dragonflies and damselflies in our area. So these are the two books that I highly recommend. So I hope that this presentation was informative interesting. I hope you learned a lot of things you didn't know about these incredible beneficial insects. Thanks for watching.